a new age. The automobile changed everything from the way we live to the way we power things. These cars were used for so much more. In fact, I met a gentleman just the other day who owned a farm, and his grandfather, what he would do is he just pop the back tire off. I brought my girlfriend out here. I'm really into history. She's from 20 minutes from here, and it's like, uh, we have to go visit the birthplace of the Model T. Through the efforts of some amazing people who saw the uh, significance of this structure in the late 1990s, it was scheduled to be demolished, torn down, and was rescued by a local historian, uh, primarily through the efforts of Dr. Gerald Mitchell. On this episode of Digging Detroit, Pete and Tom visit the historic Ford Paquette Avenue plant with their special guest, docent Tom Genova. So who, who are the Ford Paquette Avenue plant people? I mean, what, what, what organization actually owns this building now? Okay, Ford Paquette Avenue plant is owned by a nonprofit organization, and this uh, nonprofit 501c3 was established to shepherd the building in its restoration and preservation. This building was acquired in April of 2000. Uh, that was the purchase and the signing of the documents. I would say it took approximately three years to make it presentable to where uh, people could come in and take tours. Uh, one story I'd like to tell is uh, we gave a tour to retired uh, Ford engineers and executives in the, in, two, in the year 2003, which was the 100th anniversary of the founding of the company. Seeing the plight that we had in, in all of these windows that needed repair, they're just wooden windows, uh, and many window panes uh, when we first acquired the building were missing and had to be replaced. So they offered to join together as a group and create a repair team here on site. Uh, we set up a workshop on our second floor and acquired all the equipment necessary to cut the wood and, and form it into these uh, the windows that you see right here. Uh, the gentlemen have been working, there's about 22 of them have been working for 12 years on this project. We have 355 windows and it's just an astounding task that they've taken on in rebuild. And that was one of the linchpins really to get the building stabilized, uh, prevent water entry and, and uh, those sorts of repairs that needed to be done. The building was designed by Field Henchman Smith. They were a, a architects established in the middle 1800s. Uh, they had a good reputation. Henry hired them uh, to work with the construction and design. And uh, Henry here, as I mentioned, was here for six years. And then after Henry moves out, uh, Studebaker comes into the building in, in January of 1911. And they remain here until about the middle 1930s, uh, after which 3M Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing comes in. And the building is always inhabited. There are always people here. Uh, but uh, upper floors uh, begin to show the signs of age over a 100-year time period. I think one of the myths uh, stories, apocryphal or not, about Henry is that he invented the automobile. Uh, Henry, according to the research that's been done, Henry was the, at least the 160th manufacturer of automobiles in the United States. And his prime competitor here in the Detroit area is Oldsmobile, which sets uh, their first plant up here in the Detroit area in 1899 at the foot of the Belle Isle Bridge. Uh, the tragic thing about that, of course, is that that plant burns down in 1901. And that really has Henry consider some additional fire safety features that are in, designed into this building, which from an architectural standpoint are some of the key things that people enjoy coming to see here and hearing about them. Henry had a 25,000 gallon water tank that sat up on the roof and it's static fed a series of pipes that run through the building. He also puts in fire walls, foot and a half foot thick bricks, and there are fire doors uh, that are, are on a track in such a way that if the fusible link which holds the door open is exposed to a higher temperature, it melts and releases the door, and then that isolates the fire to one quarter of the building. Uh, also, the floors are made of maple wood, and they're dual layer, layer floors, very thick floors, and the thought there being it's hard to burn through all that um, wood. Another interesting little concept is they trim the edges of the columns, the support columns within the building, and what that does is it, it gives you additional burning time. It changes the path of an active fire. This plant is like really key in understanding the history of Detroit, and I think it's also very important to understand the history and the heritage of a place to understand where the place is now and where the place is going to go. I'm just thinking about people coming into a plant and doing the same thing day after day and day after day and you know that's a real big issue in mass manufacturing and uh, and those are issues today too in assembly lines in places like the big companies like 
Amazon, the way people are, are treated and exploited and, and so forth. And so how do you make it a little bit more bearable? And so Henry Ford had this technique, you pay people a decent wage and you get people in. We don't only talk about Ford, we want to embrace all the manufacturers in the area. Uh, there was at least a dozen in Henry's time, perhaps as many as two dozen as we approached the 1920s. And we have on exhibit not only Ford products, but all the manufacturers, or several of the manufacturers uh, from this area. There's a certain ambiance here. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. There's so many wonderful things that you can see, uh, such as witness marks on the floor and the ceiling, where machinery sat, where the oil stains are, where the men stood. You can imagine what it was like 100 years ago uh, to work in this facility. And keep in mind, uh, it was a, a rather uh, harsh environment because we don't have climate control. Uh, there's a lot of people in here, a lot of noise, uh, but yet it was an exciting place to, to work uh, because so much of the world changed from this uh, one building. Uh, Henry starts the company, and I've heard a couple different figures, between 30 and 50 people that start at Mack Avenue. When he comes here, the building is designed for about 300. And by the time he leaves, we're approaching 1,700 workers that are on site. Henry, obviously we know, focused on the lightweight, durable, low production cost vehicle, but there was some tension within Ford about what type of car they were going to build. There was tension in the early days. Uh, one of the investors, uh, Mr. Malcolmson, uh, preferred larger cars and, and also other board members sided with him. And Henry then has to produce a Model K car. It was about $2,800. That was a lot of money back in the time. Uh, and so Henry really had a vision of a smaller car, a car that could be used by the masses, which was more affordable, and really didn't want to be in that large car market. It did serve him well in that that K car uh, won races for him. It did, you know, get him in the record books in many ways, so it was beneficial from a marketing standpoint. Now, wasn't Ed Huff the ride-along mechanic on Henry's oh, famous yes. race against... Uh, Yes, Alexander? so preceding and predating uh, Paquette Avenue, there was a very famous race against Alexander Winton. And we have one very famous photograph that shows Henry uh, driving the, the sweepstakes, which was the car that he built to go against Alexander Winton. Ed Spider Huff is a very interesting character that worked here. Uh, he knew Henry in his later teen years, and both these gentlemen uh, had employment th through uh, Edison Illuminating. Uh, Henry does hire his friend, a very sharp electrical engineer, uh, and he works in this building right from the very beginning, helping Henry develop all things electrical, if you will. The key invention that really is a boost for Henry is the flywheel magneto. It's internal to the engine, mounted on the flywheel. It creates the electricity, the energy to run the ignition system and the charging system. Uh, very significant. He had a certain freedom. I think he was one of the men that could always call Henry Henry, for one thing. But Henry was really on a mission to work towards a smaller car, which he achieves really in his Model N car. Okay, and then the NRS, NRS series. are usually are referred to together. Together, NRS. Because they're really just, just variations leading up to a yes, um, yeah. little tweak here, a little sure, tweak you're there. absolutely correct. Like yeah. the R adds running boards, and the S car was his top of the line model. Uh, it was $750. The end car was originally introduced at $500. Mm -hmm. uh, these cars were very affordable at the time. Yeah. So they're producing, Ford's producing the NRS and probably maybe one or two other models mm -hmm. here. Correct. How did Henry and his engineers actually come up? What was the process of developing the Model T? Uh, Henry sets up what's known as the experimental room on the third floor in the back of the building and really allows extremely limited access to his top engineers. Perhaps eight or nine or ten of these men were allowed access at any time. Here with Jenny. Jenny, uh, what brings you out to the Paquette plant today? Well, actually my wife came here a couple months ago with a senior group. We lived down in Brownstown. And that's all she talked about was how cool this place was. So I said, well, we have to go. So that's, that's why we're here. Tom, this is obviously a stunning example of what Ford was producing here at Paquette Plant. Can you tell us a little bit about the car? Sure, this is a 1909 Ford Model T. Uh, this car was built here in the plant. Henry made 6,000 red Model Ts and then 6,000 dark green Model Ts here in this facility. So the total production number is around 12,000 units from Paquette. He then moves to Highland Park and begins uh, full-scale production there. So we have 19 years of production uh, that occurred. And 15 million cars. And 15 and a half million cars, correct. It's just a staggering number. And just so we're clear, there's no such thing as a 1908 model year 
Model T. Well, with the few that were built were titled 1909 cars. And so it's a 1909 model year. 1909 model year is exactly what they did. This car, as we see that we're standing in front of, it was $850 when it was new. And uh, there were accessories and options, the top, the windshield, speedometer, headlights, all these are optional pieces of equipment. Henry does bundle the options in 1910. Uh, uh, for nine hundred and fifty dollars, mm -hmm. uh, and this is a this is a crank start. This is crank start. Henry doesn't have electric start until nineteen nineteen. Okay. Cadillac does introduce electric starting in nineteen twelve, uh, so Henry's a little bit reluctant to put it on there, really to raise the price of the car. He's always looking for a way to keep it more affordable uh, to the masses. So we're standing. Where, where are we standing right now? We're standing at the very end of the plant, uh, up on the third floor. And what we're in front of is the original elevator door in which all the cars that were built here in the plant exited through this uh, opening here and went on down to the railway system, which is just behind you here. This location for Henry was key in that it has this wonderful access. Right, because this is yes. a time when, well, they're still inventing yes, trucking. Exactly. So everything has to be done by rail. Everything is by rail, so raw materials and finished products out. I must mention, though, in Henry's time, all the, all the rail lines that you see were down at ground level. After Henry moves out and Studebaker comes in, in order to stop the congestion of traffic across Woodward Avenue, the city requests that the rail system uh, be modified. And what they do is they elevate the rails to the second floor. So we see this elevated system that's put in here. Uh, Paquette did not have the assembly line here, and s some of the books have been written, stories about the plant have indicated that Henry experimented with the assembly line here. But later, future research has revealed that Highland Park was really intended to be a larger version of what Henry has here, which was called station assembly. So the cars are built in individual bays. Uh, the assembly line at the Highland Park plant actually takes three years to materialize and they experiment with building different uh, aspects of the car. And we had heard about it from several people too. So uh, that's why we ended up You said here. this was the thing to do when you came yep. to Detroit. Yep, this is the thing to do. Olympia, Washington, what brings you all the way out here to Detroit to see the Paquette plant? Actually, we're here for a wedding this afternoon. My niece is getting married and we wanted something worthwhile to do in the morning before we went to the wedding. Separate from just the tours, the building is available for rentals. And uh, for instance, we have had uh, 22 weddings last year. We do weddings, bar mitzvahs, birthday parties. Uh, the place does book up quite quickly. It's in, it's in demand. It's a wonderful historic venue and people love to, to come and, and have their events here. Another thing that is a draw here, because we're so close to the inner core of the city, we do offer uh, enclosed parking, uh, so access is easy to the building. Uh, we're just off of Woodward Avenue, a couple blocks. Uh, this building is one of the most important buildings in the history of technology. And the reason for that is this is where the Model T is developed and the first 12,000 cars are built. Model T is uh, defined by many historians to be one of the most important cars of the 20th century, and it is the car that put the America on wheels. For more information, call 313-872-8759 or visit them at fordpiquetteavenueplant.org.